Perspectives from the top this morning. It's my great pleasure to be interviewing somebody who has done uh, certainly a large career change, significantly larger than maybe most of you or me, from oil company group uh, treasurer to Church of England curate and now Archbishop of Canterbury. It's a great pleasure to be interviewing this morning Archbishop Justin Welby. Thank you. Good morning, Justin. Uh, Good morning. When we look at what's happening in businesses now and, and we think about uh, leadership and what its purpose is, um, do you feel that what we're trying to do is we're trying to get people to care about what they're doing because that's what gets the best from them? Well, certainly, I mean, if you turn the question around and, and said, do we mind if people are entirely indifferent to what they're doing? That makes it pretty clear mm. what the answer's got to be. But you can care in lots of different ways. Can't you? I mean, my own experience in the oil industry is, was, you know, you had some people who cared about, for instance, I remember at Enterprise, the, the exploration director was passionate not only about exploration, but also about the environment. Mm -hmm. So there was a holistic nature to the care. You had other people in other companies I worked with and who, who cared a great deal about what their salary check looked like at the end of each month. Mm -hmm. So the caring has to be focused. So the caring has to be focused, but, but also uh, from, from your perspective, do things go better in organizations when the caring is holistic and is focused not purely on self, but the people around you in the organization? I'm, I've, I may have got the source of this wrong, but I'm always, uh, I heard and often quote Einstein as saying, there's no limit to what can be achieved by someone who doesn't want the credit. Mm -hmm. And um, if you have a group that works well together without all seeking to be seen as number one, the opposite of the apprentice. Indeed. The absolute opposite, appalling, disastrous <laughs> approach to management. If you have something different from that, that actually says, we're going to make this as a group, and I will get my satisfaction by being able to say, I worked with that team, I was in that group, then you, can, you, you really will make significant progress. And, and you mentioned the apprentice there. What I think is interesting is, is that there are certain things that developing leaders and leaders in organizations see in the media, uh, from the examples of what happens in financial services and other places they see in terms of the apprentice about what is publicized as what is effective leadership and management that actually uh, I believe is totally counterproductive would you agree with that yes I mean it's obviously very productive in terms of good drama yes but in terms of actually achieving anything in an organization it's highly counterproductive mm -hmm. uh, I entirely agree with that most of us will at some point have worked in a dysfunctional team and will know the feeling where the best ideas run into the sand because someone cares more about their advancement than about getting a really good project to work really well. And, and it's therefore success is perhaps creating a, a more we than me culture. Yeah. And that's very difficult because yeah. we're in a national we're in a social culture and a philosophical mm -hmm. culture certainly since the 70s 60s right. with the advent post-existentialism into post-modernity you're into a, a culture which does say that what benefits me i think we're coming out of it funnily enough with the mm -hmm. post-millennials yes but that's true. um before that that what advantages me is right is what matters. My truth is my truth. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's very, very the radical autonomy of the individual, and that makes teamwork very difficult. So, if you this thing about caring, therefore, if you look back over your career um, at the sort of best bosses that you ever had, mm. do you think, therefore, that that element of if the boss shows they care about me? You know, that will inspire me to give my best. Oh, absolutely. And caring is not shown this or by being warm and cuddly. No. It's, 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 it's shown by demanding the highest standards. I mean, you know, some of the legendary leaders in, for instance, financial services, Sir so Sigmund Warburg, for mm -hmm. example. Yes. You know, absolutely extraordinary. He was deeply compassionate about his staff, mm -hmm. though he... Uh, you know, that wasn't often known because he kept it very quiet. 
but also he demanded very high standards and people interpreted that as him saying to them I value you and I'm going to value that yep. you are the best you could possibly be and if you look back at your career I'm assuming you've had people that, that have done yes. that for you can you give me an example yes I can um, uh, Sir Graham Hearn the chief then chief executive subsequently chairman at mm -hmm. Enterprise Oil um, uh, was one of the most remarkable people I've worked for um, uh, just in terms of uh, he was always challenging you he was always mm -hmm. pushing to see if your ideas had real uh, thinking in them he was always challenging a team he he but he was equally open to being challenged himself so That's I remember um, very robust discussion very late at night um, uh, over strategy company policy where we were going how we dealt mm -hmm. with the problem with a group of us around the table and and he whatever he felt he certainly didn't give the impression of caring that people were saying no no, no that's that's not going to work you know and then you'd go for it for a while it was it was an incredibly stimulating environment so yes it's, it's where the leader gives the subordinates the ability to challenge as long as they can challenge in a way that provides a, a yeah. viable solution but we knew that once he called it that was it Yes, absolutely. Collective responsibility in terms of the team. Yeah. Uh, if we look at organisations now in the 21st century, I think one of the key things that, that all the figures suggest is that you have to break down silos, you have to collaborate, you mm. have to work together effectively to be successful given the complexity absolutely. of what's happening. Um, you know, how do you think, therefore, that, that leaders other than their own team, need to behave in terms of breaking down those silos and creating, what I call it is, it's a community, not an organisation. Well, I think you, and I expect you'd probably expect me to say this, or at least I hope you would, given my job, that um, I go back to the model of Jesus on this. Mm -hmm. yeah, he's got 12 pretty radical individuals with him who have a completely mistaken idea of his mission, are constantly bickering with each other, and uh, one betrays him and 11 run away. And yet that group, within 20 years of his death and resurrection, had changed the world. And within 300 years, their successors had overcome the largest empire in the world without drawing a sword. Mm -hmm. Now, that is quite effective leadership. It's sustainable and so on. When you look at that, it had courage of an extraordinary nature. Mm -hmm. It had a clear vision, mm -hmm. had very, very clear values. Uh, the values inspired the vision. The vision mm -hmm. was lived out in courage. But there was also this element of mutual service and humility. You know, the servant leader stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Which um, is what in the end came back to them and led the way that they then led. Well, that, that's interesting. And, and I think you mentioned there the, the serve to lead element. And as yeah. an ex-army ex officer, obviously, mm. the ethos of serve to lead, uh, I think, is critical. But in, in terms of the degree to which the serve to lead concept has ever significantly got into the commercial world is extremely limited. But what is interesting is, would, would perhaps you give your insight on this, that where leaders get the serve to lead concept, they naturally become more successful. I think that's right. I mean, one of my heroes as a leader, from mm -hmm. over, which has developed much, very much over the last two or three years, is um, Field Marshal Slim in the Second yeah. World War. And the, the, taking over an, a division and then a corps and then an army mm -hmm. in absolute meltdown, defeated, despairing, in all kinds of bits, and winning mm -hmm. in the end, turning it round. Extraordinary genius in leadership. But of course, one of the ways that he that comes out in, in, in his very interesting book, Defeat into Victory, is that there is this service leadership. And you mentioned the word silo just now. I'm more and more convinced that silos are our biggest management problem. Yeah. Uh, 
often unseen, we don't recognize it, we think it's one issue among many. Mm -hmm. In terms of effective organizations, the breaking down of silos is the biggest problem we face. And leadership, you will, all leaders will be good in one area, or several perhaps. They may have come up through sales, they'll know a huge amount about marketing. They may have come through finance, mm -hmm. they, they're really good on that. They may have come through engineering. But they need to know what they don't know. Yes. And when you want to break down silos, the way you do it is not going in and saying, I'm going to break this silo up. You go in and serve the people in the silos where you don't know by seeking information, seeking advice, bringing their contribution in, enabling them to feel valued, genuinely valued, so that that collaborative spirit begins to develop. But you don't break silos by attacking them, you break silos by serving them. And I think it's that, it's that communication element, because all my experience has, has said to me that, that actually, you know, you can be the best functional technical expert in the world, but delivering your technical expertise is not the same as enabling success for the organisation. Oh. Totally, and you know, one of the you know my poor colleagues here. I you know I live off cliches, and they get used to my cliches. <laughs> but one of the ones, one of the ones I keep repeating is that policy is easier. The problem is implementation. Correct. And implementation is where you test leadership. Can yeah. you turn good ideas into action? Yep. And that is where um, true leadership is seen. And it's seen not by giving orders, but by an, because it, you'll never implement through giving orders. You have to implement through enabling others to work together so things begin to happen and they catch the bug of the sheer pleasure of actually making things work together. And the satisfaction when you go home in the evening and you're thinking, actually, we're really doing things here. It's just... It gives you a buzz like nothing else. And it doesn't matter what, what field you're in, it's that sense of achievement. On the flip side though, as you and I both well know, sometimes in the implementation of, of various plans, people make mistakes. I think one of the challenges mm. we face in organisations now is that because of the pressure that organisations are under, be it financially or the NHS or, or whatever, there's a tendency for a blame culture to start building up. And, 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 and that, I think, presents a, a great challenge because in the end it's inherently corrosive. You see, I'm, I'm thinking aloud about this, really. Mm -hmm. I'm always slightly antsy about the phrase blame culture. Mm -hmm. I think I would prefer the phrase fear culture. Which it is, actually. Which it is. Yes. That's the point. Absolutely. Because actually, if someone does something remarkably stupid, Someone needs, you know, you need to say so. Yeah. Uh, I chaired an NHS trust for a while, General mm -hmm. Hospital Trust. Yes. Uh, and we were introducing, and we did call it a no blame culture, mm -hmm. so that if people owned up to mistakes, um, that uh, there, was, there would not normally be a disciplinary process. But actually, I think what we were trying to introduce, and I don't think I succeeded, by the way, but what we were trying to introduce was a no fear culture. Yes. Because if someone said, I did an operation, I'm taking a silly example mm -hmm. because it didn't happen, but I did an operation, I left a scalpel inside someone. Mm -hmm. Actually, you need to say, why did that happen? Whose responsibility was it? That's a blame thing. But you also need to say, okay, mistakes happen. One of the mistakes in organizations, in institutions, again, forgive me for going into theology, is we believe in sinless perfection, that it's possible to get everything right all the time and that human beings are somehow not human. But it's reality, an illusion. Yeah, it's totally, but we know, we know it never happens. We know it never happens and yet we pretend it's possible. Yes. That yeah. will get you into blame and fear. Yeah. Because you, you know, you sound like the, 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 the captain the, in, of police in Casablanca, you know, I'm shocked, I'm truly shocked <laughs> that someone's yes. made a mistake. Yes. Well, everyone makes mistakes. Therefore, you've got to have a culture that says, how do we deal with error, not how do we ensure perfection? Because you ain't going to get there. 
And, and it's, I, but, but that's the that's the ridiculous thing when when I um, sort of training mentors or, or, or whatever, and we get into a situation where they're saying, um, you know, I'm a chief executive. I, I don't like to give the impression that I make mistakes. Uh, to which the comment is, I'm sorry, you are expecting your people to believe that you've never made a mistake in your life. You know, that Dream on. <laughs> that immediately blows any credibility you had whatsoever. Well, that's right. And we had quite early in my time as Archbishop, there was a yeah. process where we were talking about um, payday lenders. And the financial, we, there was a bit of a thing about it in the press. And the next day, the next day, without any delay, the Financial Times, with a clever bit of work, really good bit of journalism, mm -hmm. worked out that actually the Church of England was invested in a payday lender. Yes. Now, I should have thought of that. Yeah. I didn't, I would now. And I had to go on Radio 4 and John Humphreys at the 810 slot, the worst of all things, three months into the job. And he said, are you embarrassed, was his opening question. And I just said, yes, I am and stopped <laughs> and, and you know there was no there is a point where you just have to say I got it wrong that was wrong I take responsibility this is what we're going to do about it yeah yeah so it, it's sort of reflecting on that um, if you were to give one or two pieces of really simple advice to either current leaders or developing leaders who are going to watch this that you think would help them on their journey, what would those pieces of advice be? <laughs> I think I would say, well, the first one is that the pecking order. We always start with vision. I think I'm increasingly concerned that values, the values within mm -hmm. us, the values of the institution come ahead of vision. Vision springs from values. Vision then leads on to strategy, strategy mm -hmm. to impl implementation and policy and implementation yeah. and so on. That's your business, you're the business school. But values, I would say, be aware of your values. Uh, challenges to your values never, almost never, not never, but almost never signal themselves in advance. It's always the surprise, sleepy Monday morning meeting when you're not paying attention that something comes up that is really challenging. So first of all, be aware of your, what are your values? Where do you get them from? Are they coherent, consistent, courageous? You know, do they really mean something? Do they direct your whole life, not just your work? Yes. yes. Secondly, I would say, really going back to what we were just saying, service and transparency. Um, I would argue, but I hope you, again, you, you wouldn't be surprised, I would argue that it's better not to have got to the number one position, but to finish your career looking back and thinking, I did the right thing, I had this real integrity. People will, when they look back, they will remember that, than to have clawed your way over the bodies of your competitors and be renowned for the fact that you left a trail of bodies with knives in their backs down the corridor. Exactly. Um, Archbishop Justin, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.